All right. It is that wonderful time after the draft where the football season comes to pretty much a complete stop. <laughs> like this is probably the slowest time of the year for real. But you know, the one thing that's it's always interesting to me. I don't do fantasy football anymore, but you know, I mean, David, you know, I ran a league for many, many years. Right after the draft, it's just like right after a fantasy football draft. Everybody thinks they've hit home runs, right? And me and you, we've gone in our personal conversations, even on record, whatever, we've gone to say that like you truly need two to three years to go by before you could look back at a draft and accurately evaluate, you know, what whether the draft was a success or a failure or whatnot. So um, we can have some type of feeling about what the Bears did right now currently. You know, we had some type of feeling before the draft on what we wanted them to do. You know, uh, we went through the process and still came away with five players. The Bears traded back up into the fifth round to get their defensive end, Austin Booker, at the very end of it. But, um, but really, you truly won't know anything until some time has panned out, right? So, like, I, we could give our initial thoughts. But I don't know how much they're going to really matter because what really matters now is time. You got to just let some time play out. You've always said that it's always based on like a three year window and a clock. And there's a lot of times, and you can always reference the Seahawks draft of like getting an F, right? And then that probably ended up being the uh, the best draft in a while in the last like five years around it. And then also additionally that year. So uh, draft grades on the day of are kind of foolish and unfortunately never that accurate you know you mentioned the seahawks i just want to read you the 2012 bleacher report on the the draft grade for the seahawks so pete carroll is proving why he didn't make it in the nfl the first time not only was bruce Irvin a reach at number 15 the seahawks proved they were oblivious to their madness by celebrating their selection as if the day wasn't bad enough Seattle selecting Russell Wilson, a quarterback that doesn't fit their offense at all, was by far the worst move in the draft. With the two worst moves of the draft, Seattle's the only team that earns an F grade in the 2012 NFL draft. So, you know, th there you go, guys. Like, it, it's, it, it's that simple. Like, you can think one thing and the completely opposite can be true. We've seen it happen before in the past. So, um, you know, that's why we've taken that – rule of you, you just can't judge it too early on like you just need to kind of see it in order to have some type of opinion um but i think the way a team drafts is something that you can use uh to kind of dictate where they see things and maybe like how they are going to approach the following season just using the denver broncos for uh, as an example when you take bo Nix, that's like interesting to me it's confusing to me i don't really know where sean payton is heading with that team is he sticking around long term? Is he going to just get frustrated and like re-retire a year or two later? But it's interesting because you get you take a quarterback when you can take a quarterback. And um, I think the last I think most drafts prove that, you know, it's not necessarily always the first quarterback taken that ends up being the best. It's just one of the guys. Um, but the way the Bears drafted, I think, told me something and uh, that they were a little bit more win now than maybe me and you had anticipated going into this season. I think it's a brave choice. I don't know if I necessarily agree with it, right? Because me and you, even going into the draft, we're a little bit more uh, approaching, hey, this team doesn't have that much depth. This team is still probably a year away. The way Ryan Poles drafted, it's, it's super win now mentality. I think his rebuild for the most part is done. And every year you're going to see him or we can say this for sure with this draft, you're going to see him approaching it um, with more of a win now and adding key pieces. He didn't trade back, right? You take Roma Dunze. Um, if you were a little bit more uh, cautious, maybe planning more future, you probably trade back, take some more depth and get some more picks. But if you're saying, hey, like this guy can put us over the edge, then you take a, a player at one and a player at nine. Tory Taylor, our special teams coordinator, was on a uh, podcast with uh, CHGO, and he was talking about how Tory Taylor was uh, probably going to end up going in the fourth or fifth round. Tory Taylor is a, a luxury pick. You can do that when you're the Chiefs, and you just say, "Hey, we're we're going to be dominant on special teams." You can do that when you're like the Niners, and you say, "Hey, we've earned the right to draft punters in the fourth and fifth round." It takes a bold team that I think needs a little bit more. Uh, I don't know, gravitas, right? Some, some, you've earned the right to draft a punter. Um, however, if Tory Taylor is the best at his position or top five, I think it's a really important piece for any team. If you have a top five punter in the NFL and you're always pinning teams back within the 10 and you're giving your defense a lot more room to make mistakes, I think that's interesting. Um, and then Austin Booker, 
and the other additions were, I think, just necessary good pieces. Good draft, great draft. Um, we're not going to be the people to tell you, like, Super Bowl now, you know, but um, that's just because we're a little bit more realistic with optimism. Anything surpassing my expectations, which are reasonable, is going to be awesome and a nice bonus point. I think what the draft told us was how Ryan Poles is approaching this season and probably the season after, right? Because he's in win now mode. Your clock starts now. Your five-year rookie contract window started now. And he's not waiting for the rookie year to kind of be the dipping your toe in the water year like a lot of the teams do. And then they kind of try to capitalize on the third and fourth and fifth year of the rookie quarterback contract. He's going, we're going for it first and second year and riding it out the, the next five. And we're just going to keep supporting him and surrounding him. Yeah, it's really interesting because of the way a lot of teams do it or like new general managers do it is they tend to be, you know, a little bit more risky during the rebuild. Like we saw it here with Ryan Pace trading up for picks and, you know, signing back contracts and stuff like that just to get you to a position of where you can compete. Whereas Ryan Poles has taken the cautious approach during the rebuild. And now, like you said, he's pretty confident. He's not even going to dip his toe in the water. He's pretty confident that this will be the team that gives him the opportunity now moving forward. So the punter, it's definitely an aggressive move. Um, if they did think he was going to get drafted, I get why they did that. You know, the funny thing for me is, like, if you take Austin Booker in the fourth and you trade back up into the fifth to take Tory Taylor, I'm probably completely fine with it. Yeah, Which you still um, wind up with the same players, right, just in a different order. So it's like, yeah, whatever. But, you know, I, I want to just kind of quickly reference the 2018 to 2019 offseason where, like, all we needed was to replace Cody Parkey and we're good, right? So uh, – and we weren't good. We, we were far from good. We needed way more than that. But that was the total total focus of that entire offseason, getting kickers in here and this and that. And, like – you know, one, it's nice yeah. to be a step ahead of that, to not have special teams come and bite you in the ass when you are competing. Like, I, I get that. It's a very real thing. It happens to a lot of teams. There was a year where the Chargers had a top five defense and a top five offense, but they were the 32nd special teams in the league. They were given a punt returns, kick returns, left and right. They missed the playoffs with the top five defense and a top five offense. Right. So that stuff can really hurt you. Um, so I, I get trying to be one step ahead of that. You know what I mean? Because you don't that's a shitty situation to wind up in if it does bite you in the ass how your team is supposed to be modeled you should be a defensive first team with like a bit a bit of ball control I, I think you should take more shots this year than I think what Justin Fields was taking right and uh in terms of like big playability you should have more explosive plays and all those things but uh it, it's still gonna come down to a field position battle and when your quarterback has a bad three and out and then your defense gets to take over on the 10 instead of on the 40 or on the 30, that's a big deal. The anecdote that I saw, Richard Hightower, who's the Bears special teams coordinator, he said he knows for a fact three other teams that he has spoken to and their special teams coordinators that were ready to take uh, Tory Taylor in the fourth. So they said that if you hadn't taken him, I don't know how much that's accurate and what the hyperbole behind, you know, all that is, but that's what he said. And, you know, I'm who am I to question uh, an actual NFL coach and what he says. And one more funny thing to kind of point out that we, we discuss in private, I think a bit more, we might've mentioned it on here a few times, but the randomness and the luck of being an, an NFL GM. And we praise these guys for being geniuses and putting together these amazing drafts year after year, right? The Eagles, the Niners, and John Lynch, and all these guys. Man, Ryan Poles really did just luck into probably the best NFL situation, right? Uh, like we've been talking about, if the Panthers were just a little bit better and you picked sixth and ninth or seventh and ninth, you're probably still taking a quarterback. You're still probably taking J.J. McCarthy, and you're probably taking Roma Dunze, and you're still excited, and you're still hyped up and everything, but you got the number one bar none prospect in this year's draft and you get to walk out of that so the hype off season is now beginning and you no matter what like even if Caleb Williams doesn't end up being the best quarterback in this class which is super possible it's still super fun to speculate and you should be a good team but man the the randomness and the luck of the draft too right the Paxton Lynch uh, led Chiefs and then how that turned into Patrick Mahomes story that's always an interesting one but Ryan Poles, you you got lucky. You got the first pick in a in a generational quarterback class. For people who don't know, uh, just to deliberate on that a little bit more, um, Andy Reid and the Kansas City Chiefs called the Broncos and tried to trade up to pick three because they really wanted Paxton Lynch, and the Broncos denied them. 
and the Chiefs stayed put. That year, they wound up taking Chris Jones. The next year, they still need a quarterback. They wound up coming up and getting Patrick Mahomes. So, you know, they could have had Paxton Lynch, though, right? That's who they wanted. So it just goes to show you what, you know, sometimes you just need a little stroke of luck. Sometimes you need to be saved from yourself a little bit. I think it's hilarious that you told me earlier in the week that uh, the reason why Kirk Cousins moved down from Minnesota was because they told him they had plans of drafting a quarterback. Got, uh, you got some got some bad news for you, buddy. Put yourself in a completely unfamiliar situation, surrounded by guys that you know you, you haven't played with, haven't juggled with at all, and mm -hmm. still get a quarterback drafted higher than the Vikings drafted theirs. <laughs> yeah, really kicked them in the ass there, huh? Atlanta, like, I, I don't know. I'm not as – I see their weapons and I see uh, the offensive talent there, but uh, you're going to have to – you're going to have to really convince me to take any of their players in fantasy football this year. And then on top of that, like, man, what a what a badly managed team in my opinion, I guess. It's just one of the – they could end up being geniuses and being correct. Like Bijan Robinson could be just a top 10 running back in the league. And Kyle Pitts could have a resurgence, I suppose. And if Kirk Cousins stays healthy, if, 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 but um, a lot of things have to happen right for the Falcons. Otherwise that's a, uh, that is one, uh, that is not a, a fan base. I'm envious of. I feel bad for them as fans. It's the whole circus of an off season we just went through with the whole Caleb Williams, Justin Fields thing and everything. I remember during one episode, I told you like, Man, like, get some nasty comments from people. And you're like, dude, these are just people that can't live outside the moment, right? Like, they're, they're just living it today and, and can't even see forward. He goes, these are going to be the same people that the second we draft Caleb Williams wind up painting their nails and this and that. And wouldn't you know it, wouldn't you know it, some of the biggest supporters of Justin Fields that were some of the biggest haters of Caleb Williams just because they supported Justin Fields. Or have already, you know, turned their heads and are starting to get excited about Caleb Williams. It does feel nice to be on the same page at the same time. It's just like, yeah, you know, at least now I know who's who in this process, right? Like, but it's interesting because the kid is completely the opposite of whatever the media drew up on him. I mean, it pretty much it's it's almost like disgusting to look back at like. This kid has been such a top-notch leader from the second he got drafted. I mean, you're talking about him staying through the draft, calling the other draft picks, te texting the other draft picks, getting in touch with his teammates right away, like from the second he got drafted. Uh, you you can tell Caleb Williams is all in on football, and I fucking love that. We've said it for a while. We're, we're kind of sick of having the Boy Scout as a quarterback, and I'm, I'm all for having a quarterback that I'm a fan of because I like him as a person. Mitch Trubisky was an awesome person. Like He was a really cool guy. He was down to earth and hard worker, this, that, and the other. And Justin Fields being a really nice guy and hard worker and great guy. I'm fine with disliking Caleb Williams a little bit if he makes my favorite football team a playoff contender every single year. I'm fine with disliking him as a quarterback. Go look at uh, Green Bay Packers fans towards the end of the Aaron Rodgers regime. They were ready to move on from him. They were kind of sick of him and how they, how he kind of held the team hostage for a few years and how he acted. But I guarantee they weren't upset on Sundays when he was thrown for 5,000 yards and 50 touchdowns. So Again, I'm I'm okay with the Caleb. I'm not a gatekeeper here. Also, like you wanted to change your mind about Caleb Williams, that's your prerogative. I mean, it is what it is. For myself, would rather be a little bit more level-headed and not be, have to contradict myself just because my opinions changed after a while. Um, we've always approached this from we love Justin Fields. We'd love for him to be better, but if he's not, you got to just move on and you got to always keep trying until you hit the nail on the head. I sent okay. that to you, I think, the one day where we were talking about that pivot interview, right? The pivot with Ryan Clark and all those guys. I watched that and I came out of it thinking this is one of the most egregious, uh, I forget what you call those, like a sabotaging of, of a person's character, right? Like just the an absolute trying to slander, slander, just a slander up. job. Yeah, <laughs> sure. Like a slander job. I forget. There's like a, a term for that. Something job like slam. Like it, it was weird how much they tried to get really nitpicky um, with the, the really, really detailed stories. And it's one of those things. If he was a worse prospect, you'd be worried about the fact that he can't uh, get the, rid of the ball fast enough, that he maybe extends plays too much, that he gets hit 
too many times, this and that. But you couldn't find anything to criticize. So you criticize his fingernails and how he hugs his mom and cries. Um, and then, you know, you talk about those things and you see the interview and he, he gives you a reasonable explanation. And I think any person who would have an actual conversation with a human like that and they explain it the way he does, if you have a problem with it still, I don't really understand you as a person, right? Like my mom's a beautician. She wanted to paint her nails and I never found it strange. So she practiced on me and I got used to it and I liked it. What's the big deal? Great. That's a great logical person. The way he explained it was, you know, he, he had an emotional game. He was holding a stern face. And then I think I related to this where he said, the moment my mom hugged me and she said like, it's okay. He's like, the waterworks just hit. Anybody who's ever had like a bad day at work and then you get home and it all kind of added up and you were fine throughout the day. And then one day you just get home and bam, and you just fall apart. So I, I like the guy. He seems very down to earth. He seems just like a person that's very comfortable in his own body and his own skin. And, you know, and that's, that's important in life. And, and frankly, what I care about is football. I think we've said this from day one. Like, damn, man, can the kid throw a football? Can he, can he play the quarterback position? Can he process well? Can he get, like you said, release time? Can he get rid of the ball quick? Make the right choices. Let's see it. You know what I mean? One of my good friend's sisters that got married up in Milwaukee, and I'm there with his family, and his, his dad has had season tickets for over 50 years. Uh, so they've been going to games their whole entire life, you know, him and his brother and his dad. And we're outside talking, and we all kind of just came to the same conclusion. Okay, listen, been there, done that. I get it. It's changed. We've been there. We've done that. Oh, new quarterback. Get it. Been there, done that. Like, we need to see it. We need to see it as fans. Like, this is what we deserve now. Like, we need to go out there and, you know, there can't there can't be too many slumps. Like, we need this thing to go, and we deserve it. Like, Bears fans in general deserve a lot of success from their football team moving forward. And it does look like this team is in position to do so. It's got to get done. Like, they got to go out there. They got to execute. They got to go do it. And, I, and that's – that's what's important to me, man. I want to go out there and see some wins this next year and come out of it at the end of the year feeling good about my team. I know a lot of people mention playoffs. For me, it's it's not even that. It's going to be, like, way more, you know, in-depth criticism on the way things go down. So, like, for example, I want to see the way Caleb – handles the offense is he in control does he feel comfortable is he throwing picks at the end of the game you know what i mean like that would be concerning clutch moments things like that is the defense letting fourth quarter leads slip again that would be concerning like there's just things to how the games play out that i think are going to matter to me more than the overall record itself or any kind of statistical numbers so expectations change very quickly in during nfl seasons that's why right every team like you just said has uh, Super Bowl hopes going into training camp. Oh, my God, they look amazing in training camp. Did you see that? We went undefeated in preseason. And very, very quickly, you go 0-4 as a team, and you're eliminated from playoff contention, essentially. Or you are one of those teams that's 4-0, like the Giants were two years ago, and everybody's thinking, wow, this could be our year. And then you end up going 9-8, and bouncing the first round of the playoffs. It is what it is. My expectations will have to put them out there eventually, but I'm not ready to do that yet. We don't even know about last minute signings. Uh, Tyler Boyd got signed today by the Titans, right? So like teams are changing very, very quickly. Um, you're still going to add players. You're going to add uh, training camp cuts and somebody's going to get hurt. We, we've talked about that before, right? There's going to be a, a team changing, season changing injury in training camp for somebody. So it's going to change very quickly. And four games in, I'll, I can reevaluate and say what my actual season wide expectation is. Um, even if they're like two and two, because me and you are going to dissect, you know, the, the finer things that we see. I really hope that things click well with Eberflus and Waldron. And that was probably my biggest concern going into the season because you got handed the keys to a Ferrari and you don't know how to drive a stick. Matt Eberflus, I have less worries about. And I think Eberflus truly saved his own job at the end of last year. We talked about it throughout the season at the end of last year about if this defense keeps playing like this or whatnot, um, that he deserves another chance. We still landed, I think, on the move on, right? I think yeah, we both I landed still, on that. But... I still would have kind of liked to see a complete overhaul. I, I kind of would have. I guess in retrospect, I don't know where you would have gone. Uh, Cliff Kingsbury would have been a probably pretty dangerous, very risky. I would probably feel 
less safe with Cliff Kingsbury and Caleb Williams than I do with, for example, keeping Eberflus and giving him a good offensive coordinator. That's still going to be my biggest concern is um, how Waldron and Williams communicate who feels in charge, how well does each other know the playbook and how well do they know what complements each other. Um, just knowing the few things I've known about Caleb Williams, reading the snippets and things like that. I'm excited for the potential idea of Caleb Williams being more in charge. And I think that's something that we really, really missed with fields and Getsy is Getsy really just had carte blanche. Like whatever you think is right, we'll do it your way. And that's just – that was one of my biggest criticisms of Fields. I think the first time we saw Justin Fields yell back at his headset was maybe week 14 or something, and it was that, like, goodbye in tour. Three. In year <laughs> three. And it was that goodbye tour of Justin Fields. Um, and that was the first time I was like, finally. I wish you had spoken up week two when you got two screens in a row against Tampa. What were, what were you doing, right? Like you yell back. Right. Like if you have a problem with what's being called for you, say something, do something, be a leader, know the playbook so well that you can't be uh, told what to do without agreeing with it. Right. You can't just say, I ran this play because coach called it. If you, that uh, it was one of the things Tom Brady said in many of his interviews, if you knew this play was not going to work and you still just called it and reacted, and then you blame the play calling, that's not a play calling issue. That's a you issue. You're a quarterback. You're the captain on the field. You should be maneuvering and managing and all that stuff. Caleb Williams, to me, seems like he's wired like a psychopath, like one of those amazing – and I say that in the most complimentary way. Peyton Manning was an absolute psycho. Tom Brady, total psycho. These guys were just so football, football, football that they sat there and studied the playbook so well that they probably could have recited it better than the offensive coordinator – and at certain points probably did and therefore, you know, over uh, called, you know, called the play over their OC at certain points. And it worked for them because that's how well they knew it. Yeah. During the roast of Tom Brady, I think Brett Kaiser and Tom Segura probably had one of the worst, you know, comical segments of that entire thing. But um, but I understood it. I mean, they were trying to call Tom Brady a psychopath. They like compared him to like Ted Bundy and like Hitler and stuff. It was pretty it was pretty cringe. But at the end of the day, they're like, thank God you played football and not. <laughs> you know, to, to decided to do something else because you are a psychopath. So, and I, I, I get that, man. We, first off, we know what our strengths are. Our strengths are defense. Our strengths are the running game. We've been a good rushing team for a couple of years. We've had our defense start to click towards the end of the season last year. Before that, it was a little sloppy. There's still a little depth, but we do have a lot of pieces on defense coming together, playing really well. So, I would say stick to your strengths. Yes, be a defensive team first. Run the ball a lot. And, and slowly progress this kid up through the passing game. And, you know, he doesn't have to be a hero in week one. He really doesn't. I look back at times like th there was a game, I want to say it was against the Giants, I think, where there was like 30, 45 seconds left in the half, and the Bears are just like, yeah, we're just going to need it. Like that showed the lack of confidence in even giving Fields an opportunity to sit there and, and and check, you know, check one of the things off the list where it's like, you no, that's an opportunity. I don't like a lot of the contradictory points that are already kind of starting to follow Caleb Williams. He needs to be good right away, but we shouldn't depend on him right away. He needs to, he has to be amazing because he has all the weapons around him. I don't care if he's a rookie, but then if he fails, you could go back and blame him for being a rookie. You kind of need to be a little bit more consistent with your expectations as a fan base with Caleb Williams, because I feel like a lot of it's going to be end up being contradictory. Um, if Caleb Williams is your best player in week one or your most important or most leaned on, that's a huge problem. You should not be leaning on Caleb Williams week one to bail you out against you know, whoever you're playing, if you're in a shootout week one already, and you're just saying, Hey, Caleb, we need you to go for 400 yards and four touchdowns week one. You did a, you, something else went wrong along the way. I think the running game is struggling along the way. The defense is just Swiss cheese at that point or something happened. Um, it's nice to have a quarterback that you could hopefully depend on down the line and he can carry your team. But that's why we always talk about how that's after the rookie window. Once you pay him, he's ready to take over and carry you. But it shouldn't be now. It shouldn't be like week one. Um, but DJ Moore's comments about what is the difference? What is it about Caleb Williams that uh, you notice that's different between the quarterbacks you've played with already? And DJ Moore has played with some really bad quarterbacks. I think he had one Cam Newton year. But he said anticipation. He puts the ball in a spot where he expects you to be. 
And this was one of our favorite potential things about Caleb Williams and what we talked about in his pre-draft interviews. And, uh, and even talking about that Tom Brady clip where he made Julian Edelman better. Caleb Williams is already showing that he's, I expect you to be there at the time I expect you to be there. And you better be there because that's where the ball is going to be. When it comes to rookie seasons, I think statistically one of the best ones out there was Cam Newton. I believe he threw for 4,000 yards, rushed for 700 yards. That team still went 6-10. and 10. Man, I'm going back to the Lovey Smith days. I'm starting to look at this thing like four games at a time, win me two out of the four, fucking let's beat the Packers twice. Like, you, you want to preach change? You want to preach change? Go out there and change. Beat the Packers twice this year. Like, to me, that's it's important. That would show me change. Like, do that, split the rest of the division games, and that, to me, that would be huge. Thank <laughs> you.